Okay, guys, I know we're running like really far behind, so um, I have um, just some nursing perspective on the recess thoracotomy issue, and um, a lot of the stuff that I have was covered by Dr. Cornbro and also some by Dr. Godat, so um, we'll just move on through. Okay, so this is different names that this is called. You know, you look in the literature, there's recess thoracotomy, emergency thoracotomy, immediate thoracotomy. Um, and it just means that you do it within minutes of the patient arriving, not you don't stabilize them and then you go to the OR and do it there. This is um, an urgent uh, life-saving matter for um, patients that are in extremis, which literally means um, at the extreme or at, at the point of death. So something that we need to do quickly. So the indications, um, and this has been gone over as well, sorry. Um, blunt traumatic arrest with previously witnessed signs of life in the hospital. That was one of the, the uh, distinguishing criteria um, in one of the studies I looked at, that if it's a blunt arrest with no sign of life um, prior to uh, coming into the hospital or even in the hospital, then, then it's um, fairly futile. Um, things like cardiac tamponade, great vessel injuries, that sort of thing from blunt arrest. But they have to have some sort of life when they roll in the door for it to be even remotely possible to resuscitate them. And then penetrating trauma arrest with previously witnessed signs of life in the field or in the hospital. So um, again, um, like the other um, docs were talking about, that if it is a penetrating traumatic arrest, um, they do better than, than with blunt. Kind of sounds a little bit like our OR recess criteria as well. So, but as I'm sure you guys have all noticed that um, when we are very busy in the recess room and we've already got a trauma going on. Um, some of the attendings um, find it very um, difficult to split the team. So if you have a patient in the recess room and then an OR recess criteria patient comes in, depending on who the doc is and what the resources, their resources are as well as ours, um, we'll have to make a decision whether or not to um, do an OR recess in the recess room or split the team and take them to the OR. So. Um, we have been, I think, more often than not lately, not splitting the team. So that's why it seems like we're doing a little bit more of this kind of stuff in the recess room instead of the OR. Um, and another thing that, um, that I found in, in one of the studies, actually the study that Dr. Coimbra was part of, it was an 18 center study, um, the Western Trauma Association that looked at uh, patients over a period of, I think, six years. Um, suggesting that mechanism of injury alone is not the um, only criteria useful to determine futility. So a lot of it, um, consume, they talked about uh, pre-hospital CPR and the duration of that as to um, whether or not attempting to do a recess thoracotomy would be advisable or not, or whether or not it was just a, a futile activity. So, um, and they showed no survivors um, after recess thoracotomy in patients who had um, CPR in the field of greater than 10 minutes for blunt patients. And there were no survivors of a recess thoracotomy in penetrating trauma patients who had CPR for 15 minutes or longer. So um, again, these are numbers that you've already seen. The overall survival rate following a recess thoracotomy is about 8%. And uh, for blunt, it's pretty, um, pretty dismal, 1.6% and uh, penetrating about 11%. And again, as everybody else said, the most um, injury is a stab wound to the heart. It's a discrete wound and most of the time and, and can be repaired. Um, so some of the nursing considerations, and you know, this is how we handle any trauma patient. So regardless of what the mechanism or the patient presentation, the ABCs are always gonna be the same. If you do have a patient that's an extremist at or near death, then um, obviously um, we do the ABCs. Airway control, they're gonna get intubated if they have not already been in the field, and they're gonna be put on the ventilator. Um, those, your, your A and your B is um, pretty well gonna be concomitant with obviously doing all the other things that we do. Um, circulation, we want at least two large bore IVs. And then um, fluids, there's been you know changes over time on this as well. You know, somebody comes in hypotensive and we just bomb the fluids in. You put it on pressure tubing and you, you know, pump the fluids in until the patient's blood pressure comes up. Um, lately there have been some um, 
uh, practices of doing permissive hypotension. So if they do have um, low blood pressure, but they're worried about possibly blowing a clot off, then they're not going to want to, you know, pump those fluids in really hard. So um, depending on what's going on with the patient, if they're, you know, and CPR is going on, then obviously we want to get as much fluid into them as quickly as possible. So some of the nursing considerations um, regarding documentation. Um, I have a copy of an old, really, really, really old flow sheet I'll pass around if you guys want to see. This was an OR recess from almost 20 years ago, um, but we did everything to this patient. It was a gunshot wound. It was, um, they opened the chest, they did a thoracotomy, they cross-clamped the aorta, they opened the belly, everything. So it's all on there and um, it's just an example of the kinds of things that um, we look for in charting. So I don't know if you guys want to pass that around and take a look at it. Anyway, some of the, um, the basic documentation stuff, vital signs if there are any, or if they're not any, obviously document that as well. Any medications that are giving fluids, injury locations, and start and stopping of procedures. Um, some of the stuff that's um, particularly interesting, and if you go back and um, you know look at some of this on this other flow sheet, you know, things like cross clamping the aorta or when the chest was open, what, what did that do to the vital signs? You know, if they clamp the aorta, did they suddenly get a blood pressure because they were, you know, perfusing the, you know, upper half of their body um, a little bit better? Um, when did they do cardiac massage? You know, that kind of thing. Was there any return to spontaneous respiration? And then when they unclamp the aorta, that's kind of the most telling thing. Sometimes their blood pressure really, really tanks um, when, when that happens. So. Um, any other things, blood given, lab sent, that kind of stuff needs to be documented. And of course it's going to make a difference as to whether or not you're in the recess room or in the OR um, as far as how you're going to do that. You know, I know it's difficult to document in the OR with everything going on. So I don't know if a lot of people are still doing the, you know, putting tape down their, down their leg and writing it up later. You know, you can still do that. So. Some of the things that um, you need to have ready. Now in this patient that Dr. Godak talked about, they had 20 minutes before the patient got there. So they had time to plan and time to get ready. You know, if you have somebody that's at the back door or they're gonna be less than five minutes, then you really have to know where your stuff is and where you're gonna put it um, before the patient gets there. So generally they, once the patient gets in, they do a betadine splash. They don't generally have time for the full, you know, prep and drape and all that stuff. Make sure everybody is protected, gowns, gloves, masks. Shoe covers if, you know, you can get them on quickly enough, um, you know, because it's a bloodbath a lot of times with those kinds of patients. And the open chest tray, um, that is going to be the tray that they're going to use, you know, to, um, to do this procedure. Um, there are two in the recess room, back in the, you know, in room 13, back in that cupboard. And there's also one in uh, the CT corner, which I stole today that, you know, we're going to open up and, and look at. but. Um, so we have three of them in the unit, you know. Um, they're supposed to have a scalpel um, taped to the front, to the outer packaging of it. Um, there wasn't one actually on the one that I took, so, um, but the ones in the recess room did have it. Um, so you also um, need to know where your extra stuff is. God forbid somebody should drop something on the floor and you can't find another scalpel when they really need it. So make sure you know where your stuff is and that you can get it quickly. Um, and then consider massive transfusion protocol if it's a penetrating wound with a big blood loss. Um, and also try to get the blood bank specimen sent to the lab if you can prior to initiating that. So you don't change their blood type on them. Um, and you also need to make room on the patient's left side. I know in the recess room we're a little cramped right now, you know, just because of, um, you know, where we're at. But that's where they start. So um, if there can be, you know, room to set up a, a sterile field, and the trays and stuff, then they can um, work on the patient's left side. Um, obviously, once they're in the chest, they may decide to extend to the right side as well. And also have the um, defibrillator with internal paddles readily available if they do end up needing to do that. Keep the fluids going, pay attention to your ABG results. You're gonna have some pretty crazy base deficits, so we need to um, stay on top of that as well. Um, things to keep in mind, some of the docs like to use the FAST to determine um, the presence of cardiac activity or um, tamponade prior to opening the chest, um, they can do that. Um, sometimes if the patient is in such bad shape, they will just, you know, like Dr. Godat said, just, you know, immediately open the chest. Have somebody alert the OR if there's a possibility that a patient needs to go quickly over there. And again, know where your stuff is. And um, since we have moved, all of our stuff has changed, and you know, three or four months ago. So, um, if you don't know where it is, please take a trip around there because you know, 
nothing worse than, you know, you know, you know we have it, but we can't find it. So um, anyway, and then keep the room warm if possible and assign somebody to crowd control. It's just kind of the typical things that we deal with over in trauma. So now this patient um, is the one that Dr. Dugoda was talking about, the one that came to the recess room. So um, since you guys already talked about that, let's talk about the second patient. Um, this patient is a 26-year-old male, self-inflicted gunshot wound to the chest. This was an OR recess patient. Um, he did have some signs of life, apparently moaning, some spontaneous respiratory effort, but had no obtainable blood pressure when he arrived. Um, anesthesia was there. They intubated him. They put lines in. Um, they did get a blood pressure after intubation. They were using the level one. They started blood almost immediately on this patient um, with a massive transfusion protocol. Um, they initially inserted a chest tube on the left and then um, removed it when the, you know, obviously when they, when they opened the chest on the left side. Um, and they actually um, did the thoracotomy about 30 minutes after the patient got there. So they were really doing, you know, lining and um, fluids and that sort of thing, but they had time because the patient had a blood pressure. Um, so they were there for, the nurses were in there after about 45 minutes. They gave, you know, all this blood, 12 units of pack cells and 10 units of FFP. Um, and I never found out what happened to the patient. <laughs> Do you know Julie? Yeah, he did well. He, he did, did okay. He so. um, went to, uh, mm -hmm. he ended up having a thoracotomy a couple of days afterwards. Uh, okay. But, Do, you, um, Do you remember what his actual uh, intrathoracic injury was? He just had one gunshot wound to the chest. Okay, but yeah. what, what, did, what you know what structures. it hit? What structures were injured? Yeah, because I mean, that's what I in and out, and then they did, yeah, they just did a thoracotomy. Yeah, so this guy did okay. But that's, you know, the stuff happens fast and um, having people sort of in their space and, and doing what they do best um, really helps things run smoothly. Um, do you have anything, Julie, about what you thought went well in this recess? Dr. Potenza was excellent and they uh -huh. did have the time to, we turned him over to see where his okay. exit yeah, angle was okay. before we did anything. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I had a lot of help, Colleen. and. Um, and Jacqueline came in afterwards, changed oh, shift. Okay. So. Okay. And did you find it? Um, I don't know. You know, it's it's kind of hard to say. You know, Dr. Godet was saying it was great because you know when they were doing um, the other patient that they were in their space. Um, but you know, when we go to the OR, um, anesthesia is in their space, and they have you know all this stuff for airway control and lines and that sort of thing. So, you know, I don't know what is kind of a you know. It was more confusing spot. about the blood, just because yeah. we had so much blood going, and yeah. the anesthesia did give some of the mm -hmm. blood. But yeah, we had it on the level one. Um, yeah, that's always a challenge. You're trying to tally you up know at how the many end. Units are right. Yeah. Because but yeah, they gave it all good. to us. Like they gave us the bag. So yeah. That we could count oh, that's good. In. Okay. So that went well. And I'm oh, sure yeah. for me because I'm new at it. It was you know it was hard like just nerve wracking getting uh -huh. my blood pressure. and I couldn't get it, and then he's. Oh, yeah. blood pressure. Yeah. A lot of times, the best thing to be able to do with Charlie when you're in school, just get the other answers out of his name, and then you yeah. end up just saying his name to you guys, just like talking back yeah. and forth. Because that way it's easier to yeah. do. Because I know, because there's even stuff here That's and here, true. and you're back here, I think it's done. Right. Because a lot of times, yeah. too, they'll send labs and get blood gas back, and then. It was, it really know, it's what the results are. <laughs> so, but I think it went very smooth. Dr. Potenza yeah. was excellent. Good. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wrote all that stuff on, uh, no, I wrote that on a piece of tape. When they called the results back, I wrote down the time on the oh, tape okay. and then what we did out of it. Yeah. Sometimes it's okay, I don't have to get the whole thing. Sure. Yeah, it is. It's hard. It's hard to keep track of all that stuff. But yeah, as much as you can, you know, just scribble it on, you know, the tape on, mm -hmm. on your gown and mm -hmm. yeah, just throw it away. You have all that stuff on your gown. Well, then you you start the you start it, and you know the next person can pick up, you know, where you left off. So you have all your documentation. Well, I know you have to stay in document on the floor sheet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I haven't had that happen. Oh right. Yeah. Yeah, well, Jacqueline did do I did all the charting. Uh huh. We all we left all at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, does anybody else have any like? It's 
really all I wanted to cover just to slow it down a little bit. Anybody else have any like questions, comments, any cases that were kind of weird that you <coughs> keep? Um, I was just talking to Stephanie about the internal paddles. Yeah. The only place we keep those is on the sternotomy part out in the unit, right? We do the OR. The OR has them. Yeah. Well, if you're in the OR, but for us. But if you're in the trial room, you have to go uh -huh. outside yes. and get the sternotomy part. There was a little bit of a delay. I remember the last time we had mm -hmm. one. And um, luckily, we had three you know, yeah. nurses helping in there. But I wonder if we need to talk about moving them into recess since we don't want to do open hearts anymore. Yeah. We also we do a plan show in the uh, trauma room. Yeah. We open the yeah. 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 chest right to the Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Andy? There's something about, you know, whenever we have patients coming into the trauma bay and then we realize we need to go to the OR, mm -hmm. it's always difficult. You always hear the surgeons actually like, telling the OR, like people are saying, we need to come now, but they're never ready. What, what needs, if we were in our recess, they'll be ready. <laughs> but when we need to go immediately to the OR, it's always a delay. Why? Mm -hmm. and they never can get anybody like ready to okay. do it. How can we? Um, well, I guess we'd have to have a discussion with the OR about that. Um, I don't know, how, how much of a delay are you talking about? Sometimes it takes 15 minutes. Really? It's always... Is that a light shift thing? Yeah, it sounds like it's more to the OR. I haven't heard that that was a day shift issue necessarily, but um, maybe it's a night shift issue. Do they have... I don't know. Maybe, you know, talk to them about that and see. So it all depends if they're not going to OR 11, because mm -hmm. OR 11 is always available. Right. You don't want to use that just in case you <laughs> Yeah. So they may have to get another room available. I see. If you need to go like this. Yeah. Then you just go to OR 11. Yeah. 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 They say we're changing it to an OR recess. We're coming. Yeah. Can you say not that louder, just, just so that everyone else can hear that? Because I think that's a good point you want to realize. Oh, oh good. What? So, um, I was just saying, if you're going to OR 11, they should be available right away. There should be no problem. But oftentimes, if we're going from the recess room to the OR and we're not going to use up OR 11, maybe that's why there's a delay standing because they're trying to get another room ready. Yeah, just yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't see why they wouldn't just use OR 11 if it's that kind of a and that would be urgent matter. The, the attendee would be able to right. Sure. Yes. Right. I mean, they should be able to get on the phone and say, we're coming now. I'm going to OR Lotus and get it ready. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. it. So yes. Yeah. The only is, is the, uh, the defibrillator monitor, the only one that can use internal paddles, the one that's on the desk outside by the nurse station, or the one, the one in the room can use internal paddles. Yeah. One I just want to make sure. The one in the recess room. I can't hear the question. Yeah. Internal paddles and which defibrillator can we use for it? The, so. In the recess room is the upgraded model, okay, so you can use the internal pallets if you have to, for some reason, use the one in the unit. Currently, you have to use the, the other. You one. have to bring the other machine. But the yeah. hospital is now going purchasing um, the upgraded one, so eventually you can have one. But I will work on getting internal paddles for the recess room. So. We, we had a patient a while ago that had no access, and I know yeah. nobody does staff is being cut down. No. I think they forgot how. I'm wondering if should they give it the uh, try to blast the epi down the ED tube before they were they got a femoral line. Yeah. Another thing too, if they if they, you know, get the chest open or whatever, I mean, um, they can also do intercardiac drugs too, you know, depending on what they find in there. But yeah. Yeah, that's always an issue is access. And we've even had like that patient who came up from the C T scanner. You know, with the gunshot wound? <laughs> they tried to put an I.O. in him down there, um, and, um, you know, it ended up not being functional, but I think they got a, another I.O. in that was working. So that's another option as well. Was it working? Um, it was great. Yeah. I think one was blown. Yeah. yeah. One was definitely not working. So. You can't get one order if it's slow. Yeah. So there was other options, but yeah, cut downs, they hardly, I haven't seen a cut down in, I don't know, 10 years. The old days. The old days. <laughs> the old days. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a good point because there was a case a couple of years ago, there was no OR recess and they couldn't get access, and Dr. Kramer's point was, why don't you do staff and state cut down? So, I mean, maybe you could say, you know, bring that up, mention it, if it's appropriate for that patient, I don't know. Even during CPR, yeah, it's just that we do so few of them. Yes. Nobody knows that they're practicing. Part of it is yeah. we do so few of them. 
Yeah. 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 Um, we can always upgrade the patient to a normal resuscitation. The first knee-jerk reaction of any damn thing at UCSD is no. So <laughs> that's what killed you, right? If you tell the operator when we're coming out, the first thing is, oh, no, absolutely not. So remember that. And if you mention to maybe the docs or whatever, you know, should we make this a more resus, then we'll get the patient back. CDs those words, and then it'll right. open the doors. Because what happens, as you may know, is that at that point, the OR desk puts an overhead page, or resus yeah. now at 11. And then all of a sudden, the no becomes a yes. Right. So, so that's always the option that we can execute. Now, having said that, there are patients that are quasi-stable, where we have to explore them, we have to explore them with a, an appropriate time period. Mm -hmm. But if, the, if there is a case running in the operating room, if I'm on, I'll let them kind of shuffle things around, because it just makes things easier for them. And it's appropriate, because the patient isn't suffering. But remember, if you need to go, you can always go. Um, and like I said, I brought it over an open chest tray. It's on the back table if you guys want to, you know, browse through there and see what's in there. Um, there's a lot of clamps, there's spreaders, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so if you want to see what's in an open chest tray, please go check it out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.